All right, so we do that. You're watching Public Affairs. Berkowitz is my name, and politics is our game. And we will be doing lots of politics and public policy this evening, because we could have the next Barack Obama here. I mean, this guy, it could be like the Asian Barack Obama. Would that be fair? Uh, I think that's an, I wouldn't know. Alderman Amea, Amea Pawar, right? Yes. You are the first Asian Chicago City Councilman, right? Yes. Barack Obama, he was the first African-American president of the Harvard Law Review. You're the first Asian city, city of Chicago councilman, okay? You're both public policy kind of guys. He spent time teaching at the University of Chicago Law School. You're getting a degree from the School of Social Administration, Social SSA? Social Service Administration. Social Service yep. Administration, social worker type stuff. Mm -hmm. You've been big in disaster management. Yes. Studied that both at IIT and at the University of Chicago, public policy issues. Yes. Look, you're a match. You both think you know a lot about education, right? You ever talked to Barack? No. All right. I, if you want to talk to him after the show, let me know. I'd be, okay. I got his cell phone number. All right. All right. And, but seriously, folks, seriously, we need to get serious here. We're taping this show on April 13th, the year 2013, and there's a lot going on. I mean, and so if you ask your alderman, this is the alderman from the 47th ward. Everybody know there are 50 wards in the city of Chicago, roughly 3 million people, roughly 60,000 in a ward, right? Mm-hmm. Give or take. If they're trying to redistrict like Ferretti out of the existence because, you know, they don't like Bob so much, the second word, Alderman. Why don't they like Alderman Ferretti? The guys, the powerhouse. The folks over in City Hall on the fifth floor, why don't they like Bob? I wouldn't say they don't like him. Oh, they don't like him, man. Because look at the, what they did to his ward. His ward is completely, he got a new ward completely. He doesn't have like sometimes, okay, you, maybe 30% you know, of your ward will be new. Maybe 50% of your ward will be new. 100%, mm -hmm. right? The guy's got to go out and meet 100% new constituents, right? Oh, they don't like yeah. Bob, okay? You may like Bob, but they don't, right? Uh, it was a political process. <laughs> and directed by Rahm Emanuel? Well, I think it was a collaborative process. Everyone was involved here, you know? If, if, okay. if Rahm Emanuel's to blame, so am I. Really? You accept some blame for taking Fioretti and putting him completely out of his word? I mean, I voted for the map, so I accept responsibility yeah, for I heard vote. you guys didn't even see it. You saw it like 10 minutes before you had to do it. It was a traditional thing. Dump this stuff out. This is the same thing that they do it in Congress, right? Like it's a he major health care bill. Nobody's really read it. Nancy Pelosi says, look, we'll find out what's in there after we pass it, right? Well, it, it wasn't the case on this, on, on this time. You'd looked over your map. You were okay with We'd it. We'd been working on it since the summer. They hardly changed yours. Hardly. Yeah. They like you. They like you. Ron likes you. You ever talk with Ron? I do. Yeah, you get, you get, get along, right? Because he didn't change your word at all. It starts, what is it, Foster on the north, Addison on the south, Clark on the east, uh, Rockwell on the west. The right? river to the west, yeah, roughly, yeah. yeah. And the old ward. So oh, the, the new ward's pretty much the same, right? Yeah, we change a little bit, but yeah. You were elected in 2011, Yes. Right? Okay. All right, so, you know, enough screwing around. Major issue of the day, April 13th. Somebody says to you, What's on top? What's really troubling you? What do you need to think about today? You know, it's violence. It's violence, 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 violence. and that the only way to solve that is with, through jobs and education. It's a long-run solution, and you guys have a short-run perspective because it's every four years. You yeah. know, you get, you guys, you don't really have a general election. You have the fear in the primary, essentially, right? Mm -hmm. Is that what they call it, a primary still? Well, it's, I mean, it's a nonpartisan election, so no. I don't know what they call it. Do you have something? I mean, you would have a runoff if if, if no, you don't get fifty percent exactly, of them. All yeah. right. So if some young upstart like you. I mean, you came and you kicked somebody out who's been an incumbent, right? Well, he dropped out at the last second and put you know one of his lieutenants in. So who was that? Tom O'Donnell. Okay, and you kicked out O'Donnell. I mean, you you you, you didn't have to, did you have to go to a runoff? No. Okay, so you're like the star. You're the rising star, right? <laughs> Again, uh, you're going to be modest about it, but let's. Look, when you know policy, you know the issues, people say the murder, Chicago was leading the country, I may be leading the world in, in terms of murders per, as they measure it, you know, per, in, in terms of murders relative to the total population. Yes. We are one of the top figures in the world, murder capital of the world, right? Yeah. Chicago. And other violent crimes are high. Your ward, not so much, it's reasonably safe, but you go over to the south side, you go over to the west side, Things aren't looking so good, right? No, I mean, but look, there's a lot of historical issues here. We, I mean, the city's got to start dealing with some of these historical issues. We live in a very segregated city, and so until we start looking at things like, um, you know, concentrated poverty in the south and west sides, and understand that, you know, you look, my neighborhood's always going to be okay. It's fine, and it's going to continue to do well. Um, but if we're ever going to 
continue drawing people into the city. You know, we lost 200,000 people for the last census. We've got to figure out a way to address the violence and jobs and education because um, in, in, many, in many ways, a lot of these neighborhoods are essentially just cut off from the rest of the city. But, but isn't it the case that the first thing you have to do is sort of, you know, is, is sort of stem the hemorrhaging, you know? If something's, blood is gushing. If you walk over and see somebody and he's injured yeah. and like he's gushing blood, you don't start saying, well, we got to get this guy's weight under control, right? You got to get a tourniquet there. You got to stop the blood, stop the bleeding, right? Sure. We have to stop the bleeding in the city of Chicago. You ever hear the broken glass theory of crime control? I have. What is it? Well, you fix the small stuff uh, to prevent the big stuff. So, um, you know, you want to make sure that you take care of, of uh, neighborhoods. You make sure that you invest in them because the second neighborhoods fall into disrepair, so, so, do, so does the community. Where has it worked? Where have they do case studies? You guys look at this in SSA. You look at it in disaster. Yeah. Where are the case studies that you would point to and say, hey, it actually works? You know? I mean, I don't think you need a case study to see that the neighborhoods where there's a lot of investment, things are going well. I mean, downtown no, is there reflective. Are there, are there other cities where they've tried that and crime went down significantly? In terms of investing in neighborhoods. And in, in terms of fixing the small stuff, and then they got to the bigger crime issues. I don't think that... Wasn't that Rudy Giuliani's theory when he was in New York? Sure, but it's not apples to apples. I mean, New York is a much more dense city. Geographically, it's a little bit smaller than Chicago. You have more economic diversity in neighborhoods. You don't have that in Chicago. Do you, would, you don't think that same philosophy works in Chicago? Fix the small stuff, sure. then we'll get to well, the larger stuff. If you want to arrest vulnerable populations for urinating in the street or gambling, just know that the $600 fine that they don't pay that lands them in jail is going to cost twenty-five dollars to $30,000 to put them in Cook County Jail. What if, you know, you guys explain why you happen to pick on drinking and gambling and public urination for those who don't read the Chicago Tribune and the Sun-Times every day. There are a few of us who don't. I mean, again, I think the, the large issue is if you can figure out a way to ticket the gangbangers for gambling or for being out in the streets and, you know, just causing a ruckus, I think what you can do is hopefully prevent the murders. And that's what came up. And just We're taping this on the 13th, a yeah. few days ago. You guys had your, what is it, once a month you guys meet? Yeah, roughly. You guys got a tough schedule. You get, what's your salary, $100,000? $108,000. $108,000 and you got to show up once a month for, uh, how long was the meeting? About five hours. Five hours. Four I mean, hours. Just, do you think the taxpayers may say, that's kind of soft, you know? Well, $100,000 I mean, for showing up once a month for a five hour Well, meeting. we also have a week's worth of committee meetings and I don't think anyone who is an alderman works less than 60 to 70 hours a week. You're in that office? Yes. Where is that office? It's on Lincoln Avenue. In Lincoln. Do you tell people the actual address? Can we tell them? 4243 Lincoln Avenue. Yes, you're Lincoln watching. Avenue. Okay. Yeah. They can find you there most of the time? Or I'm out in the community. Okay. And they can see your deputies. They can see. Yeah. Who's your deputy? Uh, Sharna Epstein. She's pretty cool. She set the show up. She's okay in my book, right? She's great. She's great. Okay. So she is the number two. If they got a real problem, they can't get to you. They go to Sharna, right? They go to the number two, yeah. Okay. And there are others around there. We don't have to go yeah, through them all. We have a great staff. All right. So. The thing of it is, okay, so, and, and just at that meeting, at that city council meeting on Thursday, they, there was an ordinance dealing with drinking, gambling, mm -hmm. and drinking, gambling, and, and urination. Yeah. And what was the deal? The idea here is if, um, you know, if you're caught, you know, doing one of those things, we can issue a, a ticket, and if you don't show up to the administrative hearing, we can issue a warrant. So they've ratcheted up the fine and yeah. the penalty to put yes. you away because people have been ignoring these, these citations, right? Yes. Now they're saying, we're going to come get you. You better stop because we don't want you urinating and just, you know, it's kind of, it's a lifestyle problem and it leads to worse things. That was the idea, right? That's the logic. Did you that, vote for it? I did. Okay. But I did vote for it. So did Alderman concerns. Ferretti voted for it, but he, he kind of spoke out against it, but he ended up voting for it. You have misgivings. You voted for it. Yes. Is this the problem? We were a member of what is it called the, the, the Paul Douglas mm -hmm. caucus, but also the Progressive caucus, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. You're ambidextrous. You swing both ways, so to speak, right? I'm on both caucuses. Okay. The only alderman who's in both. Yeah. But, you know, people say that the Progressive caucus, they're just, they're just going to vote no. They're never going to go along with the mayor. The Paul Douglas caucus is viewed as more pragmatic. They'll vote no. Sometimes they want to work with the mayor. They want to get things done. Did I get that right? 
I mean, I would, there are about nine aldermen in each, right? Yeah. I mean, if you look, add them up, that's almost 40% of the city council. Yeah. We're almost getting to a majority if you guys can work together. I mean, look at, look at any legislative process, whether it's at the state level here in the city of Chicago or at the federal level. I mean, it's about compromise. It's about relationships. And I think you need all voices on a spectrum. So even if you have people who are constantly voting no, their, their voice matters because it also makes room for people in the middle to make some compromises. So you rely, if you're in the middle, you're the Paul Douglas Alliance. Yeah. You rely on those guys to be out there further on the left, they make a statement, and you guys come in, yeah. and you personally come in. So you're both there making a noise, making a statement, and then you come in with the Paul Douglas group, and you sort of make a deal, be a little more pragmatic. I mean, and Paul Douglas, you pick that name, it's interesting. Why is that name so interesting, Paul Douglas? He's a former alderman and U.S. Senator. And what else is he? Isn't he a, wasn't he a professor at the University of Chicago? Yes. In fact, for, for aficionados of people who have a certain je ne sais quoi, I love that, okay, a certain je ne sais quoi, who studied economics at the University of Chicago would know there's a thing called the Cobb-Douglas function, right? Yes. You may not have heard of that. Yeah. But the point is, Douglas was a big guy. He was a progressive. He, was, he knew economics. Mm -hmm. He taught at the University of Chicago. He's a pretty interesting guy for you to name the caucus after. I didn't know him, but, you know. That's pretty cool. It is. I think, look, when, we, when you look at both groups, I think somehow, uh, you know, people have said that we're splitting the left or, you know, one might be the mayor's group. I think at the end of the day, um, voting no doesn't mean you are a reformer, nor does voting yes. I think it depends on issue to, uh, issue, to issue. And I think the thing is, at the end of the day, what you want to be able to do is take a piece of legislation and work on it. And if you agree with it, if it's 80% there, sometimes you want to vote for it. And sometimes, you're, you're, you know, ideologically, it just goes against what you believe in and you vote no. So in the short run, we're going to make it a little tougher. We're going to try to get people not to urinate. We're going to try to not to urinate on somebody's lawn in the neighborhood. They can yeah. urinate in the in men's room somewhere. Mm -hmm. Try to get them not doing gambling, doing drugs. You know, I mean, uh, take this point, because Alderman Ferrietti, Ferrietti made an interesting comment on Chicago Tonight earlier this week. You know that show with Carol Marina, et cetera? Okay. Mm -hmm. So they were talking about the closings of these schools yeah. and how they're going to make it safe, how the schools and the police think they can make it safe for these kids who are being forced out of one school to go to another school. Mm -hmm. And he says, you know, they're going like, Alderman Ferretti pointed out, he says, they're going right past crack houses still. He said, I think he asked, he said, if we can close schools, why can't we close the crack houses? What would you say to your colleague? Alderman Ferretti, do you have an answer for that question? Yeah, I think he has a good point. I mean, I don't think we're closing. I think we're closing way too many schools. I think, I think in some cases, closing a school is akin to closing a community, and that's what it feels like. So, but 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 his point was, if we can close, we'll come back to your point. Yeah. But his point was, if we can close the school, why can't we close the crack house? Do you have an answer for him? Because. He, He's supposed to be overseeing the police along with you and 48 other aldermen mm -hmm. and Rahm Emanuel. And so if somebody stands up at like Fioretti and says, why can't you guys, the police, why can't you close the crack houses? What's McCarthy going to say, the chief of police? I think McCarthy would say, look, the war on drugs has failed. And maybe it's re time to rethink how we view drug use and whether we need to criminalize all forms of drug use. I think that's what he would say. McCarthy would say we should maybe decriminalize all forms of drug use? I wouldn't say like he, crack I wouldn't say he would go that far, but I think the reality here is um, an addiction is a public health issue. Okay. It is a medical issue. And I think um, what, what, what the gangs are simply doing is taking a public health issue and turning it into an underground economy. And so your point might be, and you know people at the University of Chicago like Milton Friedman, you know, you ever read this book, Milton Friedman? Uh, capitalism and freedom? I have not. You have, but you'd read it here using an old Barack Obama U.S. Senate, Barack Obama U.S. Senate uh, pamphlet. As I can't, I can't give you that, but I'll give you capitalism and freedom if you promise to read it. Right? I will, I will read it. Thank you. I so Friedman it. was sort of big on. He's he's viewed as a conservative, but I think he was essentially aligned with the left on this. He would decriminalize, I think, all of the drug laws because his view would be if you decriminalize. You take the profit out of it, you know, the cost of getting heroin or crack and actually the, the manufacturing cost is like nothing, like a quarter. Yeah. You pay so much because of the risk of the guy selling it, he could be put away and go to jail and so mm -hmm. forth. So if you decriminalize it, the price goes almost to zero. You get more people taking it because the price goes down, people more do it. But you, at least you don't get people involved in crime to get it. They just kill themselves essentially over time. 
or and you deal with it as a public health issue. So you're really onto something that maybe the way we may not be able to ever really solve in Chicago and other inner cities the major violence problems until we decriminalize. Well, all I think that's drugs. part of a solution. I think we need. It's not the only thing, but it's a, it's a step. It's one important step, and you've yeah. hit on it. That's a very good point. Well, and I would also say that Chicago's violence problem does not necessarily just stem from drugs or gangs. It's also the fact that we have way too many guns on our streets. We've got tough gun laws, but we have way too many illegal guns. Chicago's gun problem is an illegal gun problem. We have an illegal gun supply chain. And unless we start looking at ways at the state level to address our gun laws, you know, we've got concealed and carry that's likely coming. But not likely. The Seventh Circuit Court of well, Appeals coming. has said by June 8th, yes. you, Illinois, must have a concealed gun law or we'll, we'll, we'll draft. Essentially, I think Posner, Seventh Circuit judge, mm -hmm. and Flom essentially said, we'll draft it for you guys if you don't know how to do it. I didn't quite say that, but that's my impression. And then you get like Joel Weissman. You ever watch Chicago Week in Review mm -hmm. on TTW? Yes. Did you watch the last week? No, I didn't. CPC said, okay, we have to have a concealed gun line. Is it, the spectrum that's represented on T, just an aside, they represent the entire spectrum from the middle to the far left. Because nobody there objected when, when Weissman says, okay, so you can have a concealed gun law, but we're not going to have, it's not going to apply in schools, not going to apply in churches, not going to apply here. And so somebody says, well, well where is it going to apply? What's the point? Yeah. And he says, no, in your house. So Joel Weissman has been doing the show for 30 years, thinks the idea of concealed carry is you can have a concealed gun in your house? Isn't it the stupidest statement? I, excuse me, Joel, I don't mean inside the disrespect, but isn't it absolutely the stupidest statement you've ever heard? You wouldn't agree with that, that the idea of concealed carry is that you can have a gun in your house, would you? I just don't like guns. I know you don't. Yeah. But the whole idea of concealed carry, and maybe it's not your point, is that if a person is going to come shoot you and you're walking down the alley and you're a young lady and you know, you're know you relatively defenseless, you're small relative to this person, stereotype, it might be true, in your purse you got a gun, the person may be a little less likely to you know pounce on you, right? Mm -hmm. Well, Because it's concealed, they don't know. You could have a gun in the purse, you can't. Right now you can't do that, it's illegal, but if the concealed gun law said you can walk down the street with yeah. a gun in your purse, do you think maybe some people maybe less likely to go after that person and therefore that might have a positive effect on reducing crime. The only, I mean, that is the kind of rationale that helps gun manufacturers. I mean, no, that's no, but that. do, do you think it's possibly, people have studied this, John Lott studied this, other people, they find there are a lot of instances where people own guns mm -hmm. for that purpose for defensive uses. And in a concealed carry, 49 other states had some form of concealed carry, only Illinois. Only Illinois says we know better. And now the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals says you, that's unconstitutional. So I'm, you know. Okay, so I you, you, want to get, you want to get fewer guns, I understand yeah. that. But do you, would you concede that in some instances, guns in the hands of the right people, the good people, the honest people, the hardworking, law-abiding people may prevent some crimes? I mean, I would say most gun owners okay. don't commit crimes. We know that. And, so okay, and sometimes they prevent crimes because we saw a case, and this was shown a lot of video in Chicago recently, right, where this person came in and was being robbed, mm -hmm. and he had a gun, and the store owner had a bat, mm -hmm. and he defended himself with a bat. Yes. Do you think if he had a gun in his hand, he might have, he actually, what, he, he got that guy out of there, and it was kind of an amazing miracle story, but more likely if he'd actually shot the guy, he yeah. might have been more likely to succeed. I don't know about that. I mean, look. You, like the people in Connecticut, you know, when the 28 people were killed, 20, I think, in kids, mm -hmm. uh, eight adults, something like that, innocent shootings, the teachers were trying to stop the guns by holding up their hands. Have you tried to stop a bullet with your hand? It's no, very I, difficult. But, so, well, you see I, my point? Yeah, I, I see your point, but I think there's another way to do this, and I wrote an op-ed okay. in, in okay. February. Which said? Uh, requiring uh, liability insurance as a precondition for gun ownership um, as a way to cut off this illegal supply chain because insurance companies, their model's based on collecting a lot of premiums and not paying out in claims. Okay. And so uh, they have a vested interest in making gun ownership safer and pricing out riskier gun owners. So if you're a straw purchaser, meaning you're buying guns for a gangbanger and you have to list every single gun you purchase every month on an insurance policy, your risk 
profile is higher than mine. If Maybe I'm a you hunter. just start. I just would If I'm that person, I just don't get the policy. If I'm going to be doing illegal things like straw purchases, yeah. I'm going to take some risks. Here's another one I'll take. Yeah, but I'm, not going, I'm not going to adhere to your law that says I have to buy liability insurance. But if that's a precondition, you have to present your FOID card and proof of liability insurance before you can well, buy. You know it. what I'm going to do is I'm going to find somebody else who's going to sell me the gun illegally. Because remember, like drugs, you, you, you get it on drugs. Yeah. But you don't seem to, with all due respect, you don't seem to get it on guns. Because on drugs, a person can make a lot of money by doing something illegal, okay? And he or she will do it. It's sure as day follows night, when there's a profit to be made, the only way you can stop that is take the profit away. Legalize drugs, drive down the price, out goes the profit. Mm -hmm. On guns, if you go to some area and say you can't get your gun here, there will be another way. We know there are 200 to 300 million guns out there. Yes. You could stop the manufacturer tomorrow and you'd have 200 million guns to deal with. But here's the problem, which is, and this is, this is a part of my job, which is I don't have the ability to control what the federal government does. What we need is a federal solution. I, can't always, I cannot control uh, the state government. My job is to figure out how to chip away at some of these larger problems. So if by insurance, Requiring your insurance is a precondition for gun ownership in the state. You can reduce homicides and illegal gun flow by X percentage. To me, I'm willing to add a nominal okay. cost to gun ownership. Well, let's to do try that. it, but, but you're also adding the cost to the law-abiding citizen sure. to protect himself or herself. Do you uh, understand that? You know, constitutional rights uh, are also limited in some cases. Right. Well, not, it might be constitutional, but you're, you will inhibit some people who might use it for good uses, for defensive uses, will say it's now too expensive. I mean, I don't it's think it's called I, the law of you know unintended consequences. Sure, I mean, I'm not questioning your intentions. No, no I, I I know that, but I I would say that, you know, adding a nominal cost to gun ownership, over time, will price out riskier gun owners, and so that will make it safer for everyone. You know, to, there's there are lots of other solutions. Yeah, but it'll well. also price out some people who you're not trying to price out. This is what I'm trying to get you to see. I, I, I you'll understand. You'll price out some bad guys, but you'll price out some good guys. Life, here's what we learned from economics. Read it, capitalism and freedom. Life is a series of tough choices. It is. You have to make them in the city council. A gun owner or a potential gun owner has to make it in terms of whether he or she buys the liability insurance. So let me respond to that. I would say if gun liability insurance prices out a small group of people but saves lives over the long run, that is a decision that I'm willing to make and constantly. No, but again, you're costing lives because that guy who has the robber come in his store and he lifts up the bat, he gets shot and killed. You're not realizing, yes, you may save some lives by some bad guys not getting guns, but you may have more good guys who don't get guns and you're costing lives. This is like a Where's cold. your empirical evidence? Where's your, well, I just have to cut it off because we only have about six minutes left. Sure. We've covered violence a lot. Yes. We've covered drugs a lot. Yeah. The other thing you said is a part of that puzzle would be education. Yes. We've had the closings of schools. What is it, how many schools are getting closed now? 54 are proposed. Okay. We have the teachers union saying, we, this is terrible, we can't do this. We have some parents saying this is difficult, it may be terrible, because you have safety issues, my kid now has to walk across gun lines. We have other people say, maybe we should give people choice. Because if you're going to close their school, at least give them an opportunity to better themselves. Some people say two-thirds of the welcoming schools are better, one-third aren't. I don't know the statistics, okay? But some would say, give them a choice. Let them go to the school of their choice. We spend now $15,000 per kid per year in the Chicago public schools. Mm -hmm. 400,000 students divided into a budget of about $6 billion, 15000 Give that person on the west side or the south side Here's a voucher. You're gonna, we're closing your school, but now you've got 15,000. Some people are gonna go start up a school right next, right where you are, won't have to go to it, okay? Because now you have a choice. Some people will, because why? Because the profit motive works. So, and we hope that school would be good enough, but if it isn't, they can try it. Do you like school choice? Well, I don't, only because this. Find me a suburb that has done this because in, 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 in the suburbs, Evanston, Skokie, real estate values are connected to the performance of a school district, a K through 12 school district. Not where a school district creams students from one school to another. Community development 
requires strong neighborhood schools. And school vouchers and choice disconnects that. It, it's what makes the suburbs so you have, great. You basically what you have in the suburbs, private schools, paid for by property taxes. People chose to leave the city. Mm -hmm. They pick the suburb they want. They exercise choice. They could afford to move, unlike the people on the south side and the west side. They exercise choice by moving and buying a house. Sure. They got the right zip code. Their schools are somewhat better. So my point is, forget the suburbs. Because here's the question for you, okay, Alderman Poor. I'm telling you, 20% of the kids, only 20% of the black kids, and Hispanics not much better, in fourth grade, test out that they're reading at grade level. Mm -hmm. One out of five kids is reading at grade level. Runaway Bunny. I don't think they could read this book, okay? It's a great book, but they would have trouble in fourth grade. They don't, one, only, one out of five. Mm -hmm. Four out of five, are, we're failing. We can't do it. That's 17 years after school reform. 17 years after Mayor Daley said, okay, I got the power, I'm gonna do it. He hasn't done it. He's now a cat and Muchin, you know, making a lot of money, being, you know, celebrated. He sure. didn't do it. He screwed up. Sorry, Mayor Daley, you screwed up because you, that was his most important thing to do and he didn't do it. Now he's handed the baton to you, okay? Alderman Poir. Are you gonna do something different that gives people some choice or are you gonna just say, okay, start with, should we close those schools? Should we have a moratorium that Karen Lewis wants? I don't even know, or Bob Ferrietti. Does he want to say no more charter schools after the 60 that are approved, no more now? Yes. Answer those questions in turn. Should we close the schools? Should we have more charter schools? Should we consider school choice? 54 is too many. Should we have a moratorium on charter schools? I believe yes. And three, here's what I would do. I would say don't disconnect neighborhood schools from broader economic development. If you can understand why people leave the city for a K through 12 system, we can understand why creating these decentralized, essentially governments but with charter school networks won't work for building community. You're not going to improve education until you also simultaneously improve communities. Have you looked at the data? Because seriously, we've talked about this before the show. Yeah. School choice by Herb Wahlberg, okay? School choice by Herb Wahlberg. He's looked at many studies of charter schools, some of vouchers, going through 2007. He says they all seem to, the great majority show that traditional public schools underperform charter schools mm -hmm. around the country and underscore underperform schools. And I would say, will you take a look at that for I me? I will. And I would okay. say, take a look at the Stanford University study, which would on the surface agree with that statement, but would also say, at least in Illinois, 0.02 standard deviations. Okay. I will match your Stanford study and I'll say you take a look at Carolyn Hoxby, who's at the Hoover Institution, which is at Stanford, yes. formerly at Harvard, PhD yes. in economics, okay? She's been spending charter schools for the last, I don't know, 20 years. Mm -hmm. She says, on average, charter schools outperform traditional public schools. Would you give Carolyn a call? I think, tell her you're an alderman in the city of Chicago, Berkowitz said to call her. She'll, She'll take my call. I'll She'll be take your call. call. Okay. okay. Yeah. But seriously, there are the. There is this data out here. This is not like some crazy idea that somebody came up with. It's really been studied a lot by the school that you are getting your degree from, the University of Chicago. So what would you attribute? What would you attribute as the key difference between charter schools and neighborhood schools? Is it just the? Is it just the union? It's the, yeah, they're they very much more flexible. They can decide what so they want to do in terms of curriculum, in terms of pay, in terms of incentives. It's like the difference between day and night. So let me ask you this. It's so freedom or, it's like the Soviet Union in the Chicago public schools, and it's like America is the charter schools. Is there a difference between the old Soviet Union and America? I would say this. Look at the people who are very interested in expanding charter schools. You know, you've got the Gates Foundation, you have the Walton Family Foundation. Their argument is, Bureaucracies get big.